So, so let me just uh, proceed uh, with an introduction of uh, Ginny Roby. Ginny is a full professor in the School of Social Work at BYU. She's a nationally and inter internationally renowned scholar for her work related to international child welfare, including adoption reform, orphan care, human trafficking, assisting governments in building child protection systems, research on children and families affected by HIV and AIDS, kinship care, and child-headed households, among other things. Ginny was raised by her grandmother in post-war Korea and spent a few years in an orphanage prior to being adopted by an LDS family at age 14. She has a bachelor's of social work degree, a joint master of social work and master of marriage and family therapy, and a Juris Doctorate, all from BYU. How did you do that, Ginny? <laughs> professional student, uh, and uh, she hated law school. I think that's why we invited Lynn to, they, they're, they've made peace. Uh, but uh, what a remarkable background. Uh, prior to joining BYU's School of Social Work in 1998, she worked in a variety of social work and legal settings, including with prison inmates, substance abusing populations, uh, domestic violence, child abuse and neglect and adoption. Her students comment that she has a gift for helping them gain Christ-like compassion for those they serve and for helping them to discover and move towards their professional potential. Jenny's married to her, uh, her fellow BYU alum, Dr. C.Y. Roby, sitting back here by her, who's a clinical psychologist, and they have three daughters and two sons-in-law. We're looking forward to hearing from you. First, the prayer by Lynn Wardle, and then we'll hear from Jenny. Jenny. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope I won't be a basket case <laughs> because I feel so emotional already seeing so many of you here. That means so much to me. Thank you for coming to share this uh, um, sacred, really, experience for me. Um, I'm really humbled that I get to share my journey with you. Truly feel um, very honored and privileged to have this opportunity. Well, I'm a little uncomfortable with the title of this lecture, My Journey as a Scholar of Faith. I'm not really a scholar. I looked up the definition of scholar for the first time, and it says it's scholar is a learned or well-educated person, especially one who excels in a particular field or subject. Well, I don't know about that. I, I think that's something I'm aspiring to, but I don't know that I'm there. Um, but I feel that I am an earnest learner, and hopefully that's part of being a scholar. But I don't think I fit exactly the definition. Learning has been at various times of my life, my survival mechanism, and it's my lifelong love. And of reason, it's become a way to give. See why? Stop making me cry. <laughs> um, Heavenly Father, throughout my life has guided me in my quest for learning and has provided so many people who can support me and encourage me and sometimes even push me in the direction that I didn't want to go. Uh, and for all of those, I'm very grateful. Okay, I'm trying to get myself together here. So as was mentioned in the introduction, thank you for that very generous introduction, by the way. I grew up in um, the immediate aftermath of the Korean War in Korea. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Kirk Larson, having, being a Korean scholar, I'm sure you have a good idea. But the land was absolutely devastated. Um, and my family that used to live in the capital city had retreated um, south to avoid the war 
and somehow ended up in a little teeny village in the mountains. And everyone in the village was, almost everyone was illiterate. We were poor. We eked out a living from the fields and the mountains and the river. I think there must have been maybe mm, 150 people in that little village. There were 25 children in the little one-room mud hut school that went. And sometimes they would go, and other times they wouldn't go because it would be planting season or harvest season or whatever have you. And uh, it wasn't compulsory. My, it's really changed now. <laughs> in South Korea. Um, but I have my fondest memories surrounding learning. My earliest recollections are of sitting on my grandmother's lap, listening to her stories um, about what happened between China and Korea, um, about the scholars, about the rebels, that rebelled against Japan and China and all these massive big powers, their courage. Um, she would teach me also from her one little book that she got away with, that she learned from. And it was Chinese characters. Hanul chon taji, bulhua, mulsu. All these things, those mean different things. Chan is sky. G is earth, Su is water, Hua is fire. And I remember that you can put those words together and make sentences. And then I learned, to ha learned how to read Korean. And Korean is very phonetically laid out. It's very easy to learn. So when I was about three, I learned to read for myself. And I can remember what an amazing event that was. It was like the whole world opened up to me. I could not get enough printed material to read for myself, even though sometimes I didn't know what the words meant. But I could make the sounds, and I could read for myself. That was amazing. My grandmother loved me dearly. She, in fact, I think, lived for me because she had lost her husband and her three, grand, her, her three sons to the Korean War. She had absolutely nothing. And yet, she never seemed discouraged. She always um, found a way to be courageous. She gathered the village people together. She read to them. She taught people how to read. She erected a Buddhist temple. Amazing, in the face of extreme hunger and poverty and really hopelessness in so many ways. I think that I became the target of her hope uh, in the future of our family. Of course, she didn't ever burden me with that kind of thought. All I knew was that she loved me. For example, I remember that you know we built these little fire, little wooden fires. Even wood was very scarce because of the war. Um, she would go collect some in the dead of winter. And she would build a little fire at the beginning of the little tunnel that goes under the room. And there would be just warm, little warm spot. And she would help me sleep on that spot. And here she is, an old lady with aching bones, I'm sure. She never said so, but in retrospect. It's amazing that she loved me so much. From that, I learned what love is, the strength and the power of love, and how that attachment becomes a foundation for life. She also gave me an amazing vision of who I could be. There was a famous woman at that time whose name was Dr. Helen Kim. 
And she, had, she was the first woman in Korea to ever receive a PhD. And she told me, you know, if you keep learning, you're so smart, you could be like Dr. Helen Kim. Well, in my little mind, you know, if grandma said so, of course, it can be true. But as I grew older, I kept thinking, how would that happen? <laughs> How is that even possible for me to even think that is possible? But that vision somehow continued to guide me, continued to give me some kind of a goal. When I was in the fourth grade, my teacher came to see me and my grandmother in our little shack, and he said, Mrs. Lee, I can't teach your granddaughter anymore. I've taught her everything I know. So if you want her to be more educated, you're going to have to move to a bigger city. And he suggested that we move to the capital city of the province, which is now Daejeon, which is the third largest city in Korea. So this we did. Well, it was very scary. <laughs> very scary for me. Um, there were something like 60 students in each classroom. There were about five classes of the same grade and thousands of children in the elementary school. Whew. I'd never seen so many school in my whole, I mean, so many people in my whole life, let alone so many children my age in one classroom. And anyway, the first exam I took I came right in the middle of the class. Well, this was devastating for me. So I studied studying really hard. So during fifth and sixth grades, I was getting ready to take the big midterm exam, or rather the exam to go to junior high school. Middle school exam is what I meant to say. Back in those days, you had to take exams and depending on your score, it would determine which school you got to go to. Well, the way that my grandmother and I were thinking, really, after she's gone, I wouldn't have anybody to support me except me. And I had to make sure that I found a way to make my way through this world. That meant I had to get into a good school, period. And so that was my goal. That was her goal. Um, I remember having a cold bucket of water by my where I studied and dunking my head in there <laughs> several times just to stay awake at night so that I could get myself ready for the next day. Because whatever it took, I was going to do. Whatever it took. This was my mission. This is what I had to do. And uh, it didn't seem that hard, but now I look back and I think, my goodness, I was a tough little thing, you know? Yeah, um, I'm glad that I had the courage to do that, that I had the support of my grandmother and my sense of goal to, to be able to do that. Um, well. I rode the train at the, it was in the fall of my sixth grade. Um, I rode the train to the big capital city of Seoul. And I took the junior high exams. It was very scary. And we didn't know for several weeks, but then the news came in the mail. It was a wonderful day. I had gotten in to one of the top three schools and with a full scholarship. So this meant that we had to move again now to the capital city, a big, big city by then that had changed from when my grandmother lived there. She was very old, and in fact, I had been sort of taking care of her the last couple of years prior to that. So we had to part our ways. 
So the plan was made that I would go to Seoul and uh, stay in an orphanage, and she would go to a Buddhist monastery where parishioners could stay and serve until they passed away. That was the only solution. So this we did. So at age 11, I had a little teeny pack. I don't think I had many belongings at all. Um, and I entered the orphanage. And I started my school at the big fancy junior high school where lots of wealthy children went. I remember taking my little lunch from the orphanage, which, which was barley and some pickled turnips and going and finding a corner and eating it because I wasn't going to be felt sorry for by anyone. I was very proud, <laughs> you know, and I wasn't going to have anybody feeling sorry for me in any way. But I had to fight the crowds. I had to develop antennas in the back of my head because back in those days, Korea was a very dangerous place. It was a survivalist society, dog eat dog. Um, but interestingly enough, at the orphanage, we had um, morning prayers and scripture reading every morning. We had to memorize the scripture from the Bible to even get our bus token to go to school. And later, I was to find out that the director of that orphanage was none other than Sister Hwang Gunok, <laughs> who had graduated in social work from BYU, in sociology, I think, from BYU, and had received a license as a social worker and had started this orphanage. Well, we didn't know that. In the meantime, I was enjoying learning. Even though I had these uh, emotional times where it was lonely, you know, there was a, a crematorium where people are um, cremated that I had to walk by every day. And I remember, especially at night, it was very scary because there are so many stories about ghosts, you know, that would haunt you and, you know, hurt you and things like that. And um, also, I remember walking by windows of families um, because these little teeny houses literally made out of corrugated plastic were lined alongside the roads. And I could see little flickering candlelights or something coming from them. And I could see and hear people, fathers and mothers and children, in those little places. And how I wish I had a family. But I still took courage because I had been introduced to Christ and I had faith that a loving divine being knew me and that this is time that I had to go through, that this was the trial, if you will, of my courage and my faith and that doors would open up. In the midst of all this, a life-changing event happened. A volunteer came to the orphanage from the US Army, an American soldier, six foot six tall, had a guitar flung over his shoulder and came to volunteer at the orphanage. His name was Stan Bronson. And Stan was going to be here, but was not able to do that because of the last minute um, situation. But Stan was amazed at how well we, the girls could sing. And he, being a musician himself, and he'd made several albums back in those days. They were called albums, by the way. <laughs> before he served a mission to New Zealand and then was drafted into the army. And he happened to be stationed there in Seoul. And he was inquiring around to see where he could do some volunteer work and was told, oh, there's an LDS sister who has an orphanage. Why don't you go check it out? So that's what he had done. 
So having found out that we could all sing, he thought, huh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could all make an album together? And this we did over time. In the meantime, he decided that he wanted to do more than that. So the Christmas uh, of 1967, he organized a Christmas gift exchange. He took Polaroid pictures of each of us, sent them to his mother, who was the Relief Society president in Blanding, Utah, just south, you know, in the southeastern corner. Each family picked a picture. And the sizes were in the back. So based on what the sizes were, if they had some gently used clothing, a coat particularly is what he was asking for, then they would pick that child to send um, used clothing to. Well, a family called Barton and Venice Lyman chose my picture and me. And they sent me not only a a wonderful coat, first one I've ever had, I think, to that point, but also some other dresses and things that my older sisters, oh, I've already given away the story. Well, anyway, I wrote them a thank you note, and eventually they ended up adopting me, something I never, never knew that would happen. Um, so I was adopted by this wonderful family, LDS family, and it was amazing to once again be enfolded in the love of a family. And I felt like I had roots and wings again, you know, to, to well, if you got that, you know, you've got everything, to be honest. You've got everything, right? So let me just show you or share with you a letter that Stan wrote about the time that he met me. And this is just to show you that my landing it in the United States was not an accident. He says, Dear Ginny, you know somewhat of how much you mean to me. And although I have not been the perfect friend, well, he has been a perfect friend, over the past 49 years, you have known that I love you very much. My memory remains vivid of seeing a beautiful and elegant little girl on my first visit to Songju Gwan, that's the name of the orphanage, and of hearing and feeling a voice of spirit say, this girl is to go to America. At that point in my life, having served a full-time mission for the church, I had experienced spiritual promptings which I knew I would never deny as having come from God. But nothing like this one, not with the impact of specific words which I soon knew were to be the directive which I would be required to act upon in order to help facilitate some special though unknown purpose. On my next visit to Songju Gwan, I learned that the name of the little girl who impacted me so much was Jo Yung Jin, and of course, it was you. I can only go back to the words of the Spirit's voice. This girl goes to America and added to them on a mission for God. Well, those are, for me, very intimidating words. I would soon go leave my adoptive home to go to college. And of course, my first day, the third day at college, I met the man that I would marry and form my new family with. First time he asked me to marry him, I told him, I really like you a lot, but um, I don't think the timing is right. He says, why not? And I said, because. I know I'm going to get a PhD, and I need to do that before I get married. And I also need to write a book. I had no idea what it was about, but <laughs> my goal was that I was going to have my PhD and have written a book before I got married. Well, of course, those weren't really God's plans. 
those were just my silly plans, you know? And uh, so after, when he asked me again six months later, by then I knew it was right. And he has been my greatest champion ever since. I came to BYU and ran into the social work, well, program before it was even a BSW program. Ran into Jean Gibbons is more like it. Um, some of you know Jean. He was a professor here for a long time, started the social work program here. Well, he just took me under his wings and, you know, fathered me to death and uh, just came to love him so much. And he had so much confidence in me. Um, in fact, he even talked me into getting my master's degree. Um, and I went into the master's degree and the MFT thinking that I was going to get out with my license, my degree, get my license, sit in a nice leather chair, and see depressed um, middle-class housewives, or you know, and uh, maybe make a lot of money. Well, none of that happened because uh, during uh, graduate school, I have to see what time it is. During graduate school, um, I had a policy course from John Staley. Does anyone know John Staley? Some of you do. Yes, um, we have a scholarship named um, after him, but he was a, a former Catholic priest turned um, LDS convert, and he was teaching here. But he was such a powerful uh, teacher and what he taught resonated with me so much. Working for the poor and vulnerable at the macro level, boy, my world just opened up to a new vista. And I turned 180 degrees. And then out of the blue, the opportunity came to uh, establish and direct a community-based agency for abused and neglected children and to assist their families. Ah, never planned on that. So many things I never planned on just kept happening. But when it, was, when it was before me, I would pray and I would know that it was right, that it was the right direction, that it wasn't my decision, but it was Heavenly Father's guidance for me. And I had lots and lots of trust in him. Sometimes I was scared. Sometimes I didn't want to do some things, but I knew it was the thing I should do. <laughs> and um, well, a few years after doing that, then I kept getting strong promptings to go to law school. And here I have to watch my words because there are several people here from the law school. <laughs> to cut to the chase, I hated every minute at law school. <laughs> um, I just completely felt like fish out of water. I, um, you know, back then the emphasis was very much on corporate law, business law, and criminal law, and none of those were interesting to me. None of those felt right to me, and I just had to, you know, muddle through those things. The one bright spot was family law. Lynn Wardle is here, and I was going to say that anyway, Lynn. <laughs> Lynn became my mentor, and... Um, he, he was a wonderful support to me and encouraged me actually to apply for law school as well when I shared with him, Lynn, I keep getting these weird feelings like I need to go to law school. And he would say, well, let me help you. What do you need to know? And it was great, great. And he later also supported me through serving on the um, board of directors for the Family Support and Treatment Center, which I had founded anyway. So, um, okay. After law school, while my study buddies went off to Wall Street, Beijing, and London, you know, with six-figure salaries, well, I had three children by then. And so I went straight to my kitchen table, basically. And uh, when my youngest one turned, um, well, six and was in first grade, I set up a little law office, and I was practicing law and being a happy little lawyer. Um, then comes an invitation to join the um, guardian ad litem team. 
another thing that I never planned on, nothing. Anyway, I thought, well, I don't know if this is right, whatever. So, of course, my usual, you know, we pray. I pray, we pray, you know, we seek the Lord's guidance, and it felt right. And so I joined that team and uh, represented the best interests of abused and neglected children. <sighs> Several years after that, out of the blue again, comes an invitation from BYU to apply for a faculty position. What? I told them, look, I'm not qualified at all. Forget about it. I'm not, I don't have a PhD. I just have a little measly JD, you know. I don't know how to do research. I, I don't think so. I'm the wrong person. They said, well, no, we've already thought about all that. And uh, we still think you can make a contribution. Plus, it was the opportunity to replace my mentor, Gene Gibbons. <laughs> Ooh, hard to pass up. So what did I do? I did apply. I prayed about it, felt right, applied for it. And that was 18 years ago. Well, I was really scared because I knew that I was sort of in a territory that I didn't belong. What I mean by that is I don't have a um, research background, you know? And so that's been a, a challenge, really, frankly, ever since. And although I have great desires to learn and know things in order to apply the knowledge to the vulnerable families and children around the world, um, I have always felt a little bit of a handicap, if you will. Um, still, the Lord has assured me, you still have a place here. I still want you here. I still want you to find a way to make a contribution. And so I have done that. But more than anything, I feel that, if anything, um, I can open up a vision for my students to see that every person can make a contribution. Every single person, they might not think they have talents, but you see, Heavenly Father sees you. Heavenly Father knows you better than you do yourself, and he knows the contribution you can make if you are willing, if you're willing. That's the way that I feel um, my path has gone. Sometimes I really am daunted by what I have been led to do. But I remember that the Lord said, for I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left. And my spirit shall be in your hearts. And mine angels round about you to bear you up. That's in DNC 8488. In DNC um, 212, 45, and 46, he said, Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. Boy, I really hang on to those words, you know? Lots of times I say to Heavenly Father, I know you have brought me here. I know this is where I'm supposed to be. But I'm really nervous. I'm really scared. I don't know if I have what it takes to do the job. And he always reminds me, I brought you here. We can do it together, you know. I'm not going to leave you alone because I need you to do this. I need you to do this. He says, if we do that, the Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion. And I can attest to that. My path from a poor, nameless girl to someone who can give and contribute, as modest as it may be, has become possible because of the love and guidance of my Heavenly Father and the angels around me, both alive and dead. I have no particular talents. I am a very ordinary person, seriously, but somehow he saw in me a useful tool. All along the way, he has provided the way, the people, the love and the support that I have needed. Yes, he has blessed me, but it's not about me. Honestly, it is not just about me. 
He needs each one of us to help him help his children in some way that we each can, whether through social work, law, sociology even, I'll say that for my sociology colleagues, chemistry, business, or through building strong families. And the family proclamation has been my constant guiding light, by the way, in all of my research work. But our family really is the whole world, and all of his children are our brothers and sisters. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with my sniffles. But I really am happy. <laughs> and once again, thank you for coming. And I see so many. Oh, Clarolyn, I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> Clarolyn used to work with me in the Guardian Ad Litem office. And yeah, so, so many special people. Um, lady in the back. I was adopted in April of 1969, and she passed away in February of 1970. Her work was done, I believe she felt. I'm so grateful for that. Yes, please. Well, I'm sure they're inseparable. I mean, I don't know exactly, you know, how, but what I know, and I told you earlier, that my, the foundation of my life was formed when I was, when I was living with my grandmother, who provided me the love and the care. And so that's been a constant theme in my life. And to have found family again, later after losing family and realizing how precious it is. That's, that's guided my work. Yes, please. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your professional work, particularly globally, and what you see as your professional mission? What, what seems to be evolving as to the type of opportunities and contributions you're able to make? What I see is that um, my energy is really in helping families to be strong and to be able to um, provide the attachment that children need. And so whatever strengthening families need, I'm really interested in, for example, family preservation work, um, family um, parenting skills work, um, reintegrating children from orphanages back with their families because many of them have families except for education. And I'm very interested in um, making sure that children are able to receive education. Um, some sad situations too on the other end is that when parents are facing their own demise, I'll never forget in Mozambique, doing research with mothers who'd been sent home from hospitals to die because they were in late stages of AIDS and there was nothing more that could be done. The village people that took us to these mothers, and I can't describe the squalor in which they lived. And they said afterwards, they said, what will you do with this information? And I said, we will tell their stories for the whole world of what they're going through, you know, what they plan to do with their children, um, and so on. And they said, you know that that's going to be a little bit too late and a little bit too little. And that really struck me, you know. And so that motivated me to, I think, Jane and... Some others from law school know about my project to take law students and social work students to Uganda 
I think, two years after that experience to help them write wills and memory books. Yeah, so that's in, and I'm wanting to make sure that children are not treated as commodities in the, you know, adoption process, but that the adoptions are able to be done correctly and that children who are in need can, in fact, be placed in loving families. So there's a lot of different things I've done to hopefully reflect my Heavenly Father's will <laughs> to make sure that children can experience that love and attachment in a secure, loving family. Anything else? Yes, um, um, Jane. Well, that's quite a long, requires quite a long answer. But let me just say this. I do think there's a huge momentum to strengthen families to stay together in the first place. I think we're identifying a lot of the factors that can be targeted to help families stay together in the first place. In the second place, when that's not possible, I think we're working very hard at making sure that adoptions are done ethically that children are not being sold, bought and sold um, unethically. Uh, but right now, at the moment, we're going through some growing pains in the intercountry adoption scene because we are going through a corrective phase. So the Hague Convention, which is an international convention for ethical adoptions, is being ratified by more and more countries that call for um, more stringent standards which is making adoptions harder to do. So once all of that's been sorted out, which I'm very confident that they will, it'll take time, but I do think that adoption will find its rightful place. Okay. Well, Alan, thank you so much. Thank you very much.